come with us now, if you dare, down a rickety staircase into a dank, dark basement. What awaits the Saturday Night Freak Show? <laughs> hey, thanks for listening to the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast. We're a movie talk show that comes your way every Saturday, whether you're ready for it or not. Hey, do us a favor. Wherever you found us, please give us a like or hit that subscribe button. Give us a review or a rating. All of that stuff helps us get found by other like-minded folks like you. And we like you. And we want more people like you to like us. Uh, These are the internet radio superstars. Holly and Kayla. Sean. And I'm Colin. And tonight we watched a movie that was chosen by... Kayla, did you choose this or did it choose you? What did we watch tonight? <laughs> uh, we watched Fire in the Sky. Were you were you abducted and replaced by a different Michaela who made you, know, you pick this movie? We'll, we'll just have to wait. <laughs> I can't answer that right now. Okay. Are you trying to administer a lie detector test to me right now, Sean? Right now, <laughs> yes. You can, you guys can't see it, but I can see all your pulses are up. It's a new Zoom feature. <laughs> did you pay extra for that? Is that part of the premium plan? No, I no. I have that, and no, I didn't have to pay extra. <laughs> How come they don't add that to Zoom? I mean, come on, lie detectors. That's the next uh, next stage in this. That yeah. sounds like a really stupid TV show on History <laughs> Channel that I would probably watch at least once. I mean, first, I think they have to figure out how to keep Zoom from crashing before they can get that feature. No, this so. is true. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. What year did uh, Fire in the Sky come out? 1993. And uh, who directed Fire in the Sky? Robert Lieberman. And what would we know him from? D3, the Mighty Ducks. (laughs) Oh, damn. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And a lot of television, including Dexter, amongst other things, but a lot of television. And related to this, I think, uh, like, Falling Skies, (laughs) The Expanse, and um, what was the other? There's several other, like, UFO. Lots of UFO-based things around this time. Yeah. I like aliens. Um. Yeah. Fire. What is the writer? Oh yeah. Who's who wrote this movie? Uh, Tracy Torme. And who is uh, he? He wrote on Star Trek: The Next Generation for a very long time. And who's his dad? I don't know. Mel Torme. I was Mel gonna Torme. say it's got to be Mel Torme, it's right? Mel Torme. That's Torme. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the Velvet Frog. No, nobody. <laughs> Mel Torme. He wrote. The Christmas song, he, not the not the lyrics, yes. but he wrote the music. Chestnuts yep. roasting on an open. Yeah, that's gotcha. yeah, Mel Torme. Yeah, uh, recorded in what was it? Blue Moon. Well, other, yeah. Tracy Torme also was the creator of the TV show Sliders. Aha! Uh-huh. So uh, Is that the people who like slid through time? Yep. Yes. With John Reese Davies, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And he wrote on the Outer Limits, and he wrote on Carnival as well. So he's. Really, kind of in this genre. I was say, so so this was a st- this was a strategic pull in for this. I think so. Okay. <laughs> well, this is maybe the first time that we've done a movie in this genre. Am I wrong? Is this our first alien abduction movie? There's so few of them. Probably. There's. I, I think can't so. think of many at all. <clears throat> they, they had didn't wasn't there a run of these yeah. in the nineties? Yep. Like, I remember a bunch of these, and they all look like that. Yeah. Yeah. The one that, uh, awesome. I mean, a lot of people talk about uh, Communion with uh, Christopher Walken, which I don't recall ever coming to theaters, but that's, uh, you know. what Was he playing the alien? Because that would make sense. <laughs> uh, so we're, no, we're, unfortunately we're, not. But you, So we're saying that there is a, a difference between an alien invasion movie and an alien abduction movie. Correct. Isn't this? Yeah, Very big yeah. difference. Yeah, this is okay. not. Uh, yeah, this is not signs. Signs mm-hmm. would not be an alien abduction movie. Mm-hmm. This is not literally any other alien movie you can think of. Close Encounters. Um, I'll fuck what's that. There's a there's a you little hint towards Close Encounters in this. Well, the fourth oh, kind with Mila Jovovich might have been one of the last ones, uh, more or more yeah. recent ones that they did. That is a terrifying movie. Holy shit! That and movie scared the shit out of me when I saw it. And that's partially like I, found footage or something, right? Where it's like, uh, or dramatic. it's based uh, off real stuff. The owls and all that shit. Based right, off real stuff. That We're of that. saying real things here. Are we putting this in quotes? This movie starts off with a based on a true story thing, which it is does. always suspect. If Fargo so wait, has taught us on. nothing. I want to go around the room real quick and ask questions. Oh, here we go. Oh. 
<laughs> He's do you guys believe down. in aliens? All right, yes. where do I start, Sean? Yeah. Do you guys believe in aliens? Okay, Holly is off. Michaela, do you believe in aliens? Yes, because I think it's completely narcissistic to think humans are the only life in the universe. Agreed. Okay. Colin, do you believe in aliens? Well, I mean, as Michaela <laughs> said, I think it's uh, narcissistic to think that humans are the only uh, 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 life forms in the universe. However, I think it's improbable that they are uh, able to cross the vast distances and visit Earth. But there's a whole lot of like, oh, yeah, I went down the whole alien thing because <laughs> I was alive in this period of time. And, you know, the Roswell book came out and that became like a big deal about the, you know, UFO you crash in New Mexico in 1947. Y'all need to watch the, need to watch the uh, alien episode uh, in um, Unsolved Mystery season one. Mm hmm. It's really good. It's so good. Uh, I haven't watched it yet. It's Maybe one of the it best tonight. like alien testimony things I've ever seen. It's, it's so super good. good. And let's not th- forget the massive pop culture appeal of the oh. X-Files, which exploded on the scene in uh, September of the same year that Fire in the Sky was released. Um, I, I am not, I'm not going to lie. It started my crush on David Duchovny, and I have no shame of admitting that. The truth is out there, Holly. Yep, the truth. The truth has just been—it's come out. I found the truth. It's in David Duchovny, and he's beautiful. (laughs) Um, so um, alien abduction stories apparently got their start uh, in—I mean, became like a widespread thing. In 1961, there was a case of uh, Barney and Betty Hill, or Betty and Barney Hill. Not uh, yeah. So the Flintstones came out in the 60s, 1960s. So they would have. Uh, that was the first widely reported story of alien abduction in America, right? <laughs> Betty Hill abducted by aliens. <laughs> Barney, Barney, Cue Betty the and Barney. Sex. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Barney. <laughs> I was like, I'm pretty sure they did that episode on Bunny Hill. <laughs> Yeah, Barney. Sorry. Okay. Well, there's there. So this keeps going. So uh, the story, their story, right, which happened in 1961, was made into a television movie called The UFO Incident. It was uh, one of those NBC movie of the night things, and it played on TV in 1975. Two weeks later, the Travis Walton incident happened. Did he see the show on TV just two weeks prior? to his disappearance. Who is Travis Walton? He was a forestry worker in the seventies that had like a mild interest in like UFO and the unexplained, which I don't think is like a strike against him. Like some people seem to think only because in, 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 at that time that would have been unusual to have a interest in uh UFO stuff because it wasn't, you know, like um, a pop culture. Is it though? Thing because or... it's post Roswell. So is it weird? Like, oh, that's not weird. I we've already had a major like movement of it in this country, so I don't think it would be that strange. It might for nineteen seventy. What are we here? Nineteen seventy-five, small town. People would probably think he not he was like crazy, but it's just like, why do you believe in that stuff? Mm. It's not real. Like, I can see there would be a negative reaction towards him at this point if he was just like, hey, you guys want to talk about aliens? So I can imagine him keeping it to himself. I think space became like a big thing in the American, uh, you know, conscious because of obviously the moon landing, you know, mm-hmm. uh, the interest in uh, that NASA had in space. 2001 yeah, came the, out. The moon and, landing sparked like a religious experience with people. Mm-hmm. Like people don't, I don't think they take that into consideration as much as it, like it had a massive impact. People had like these like life altering experiences watching that. Yeah, because you got to look up for the first time and, you know, think about the, uh, well, not for the first, sorry, but I mean, it, it, as a culturally significant thing, it became like a, a big deal to think about uh, life on other planets and exploring the galaxy. Um, then, of course, Star Trek comes along and, you know, science fiction movies and eventually we get Star Wars and boom, there we go. Um, okay. So Travis Walton writes a book, a books called the Walton experience. This is turned into a movie in 1993 called fire in the sky. Who's in fire in the sky. Good title, by the way, DB Sweeney. Oh yeah. DB Sweeney from the cutting edge. Yeah. Yep. Topic. I was like, why does his name sound familiar? And then I looked up his credits and it's like, oh, he's just been like small roles in like every TV show that's ever aired basically. Yeah. He plays I think he, the aforementioned Travis Walton. I think he uh, worked with Peter Berg a, a few more times after this. Peter Berg's also in this movie. Who's he? 
director, director of Battleship. <laughs> <laughs> director of Sorry. every Mark Wahlberg movie, Lone Survivor, oh, yes. Patriot Day. True. There's a couple others. Uh, I believe he got his start. If you horror aficionados will remember Wes Craven shocker, right? Oh, he yeah. directed Friday Night Lights and then he became like a he, he's a big time producer, big time director right now. Uh, who else is in this movie? Robert Patrick. <laughs> Robert Patrick. This is like his first movie off of the success of Terminator 2, right? I believe that was 91. This is yeah. the leading this is role. This is an for interesting follow up. Isn't it though? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, yeah, it feels think- like this was earlier. No, this was, uh, I had never heard of him, to be honest, before T2. That made him huge, right? Everybody mm-hmm. was aware of who Robert Patrick was, and they cast him in uh, in this, in the lead role, basically. He's the major character in this, a guy named right. uh, Mike Rogers. Uh, all of the cast is filled out by, uh, like, these pros, right? That um, I mean, you got James Garner in this movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought that was a casting coup when I saw this originally, because you not, don't expect to see James Garner in your sci-fi movie. Yeah. <laughs> he's the investigator. He's like the special uh he's not a sheriff. What is he? He's a special He's ex- like the guy they brought in in Town the Dreaded Sundown. Like the, right. the special marshal that comes in to to figure everything out. Yeah. I don't even think he's state police. He's like uh He's like CBIT, like he's a special investigation unit. Yeah. Noble Winning- Winningham, he's the uh the from Last Boy Scout and other movies that you've seen. He's the sheriff. Uh, but the logging crew, right, that, that's uh, Travis Walton, Mike Rogers, uh, that's also filled out with Peter Berg. Uh, you got Bradley Gregg. He was in um, Nightmare on Elm Street Part 3. You remember him? Uh, you got Craig Schaefer. Craig Schaefer was uh, yeah. from uh, Nightbreed, uh, Clive Barker's Nightbreed. He was, in a, he was in a lot in the 90s. Hellraiser Dead. Um, he was in a River Runs Through It, right, which I had it. to watch a lot. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's with that movie. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Yeah. I've watched that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever happened to these people? Right? I don't know. Uh, Henry Thomas <laughs> is in this, in his transition from uh, boyhood to boy to man. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, he had played, um, Henry Thomas uh, was just known as the kid from E.T. for a while. And then. Uh, <laughs> He grew up a lot in these few years. Yeah, because when was Psycho Four? Was that like the that was the, the year before or something like? But that was the first time it was like, oh, Henry Thomas is an adult, you know, and you know, right. and he played Norman Bates. Can't say I watched Psycho Four. Sorry, didn't but, get can't there. say I'm real literate in those sequels at all. <laughs> didn't get there. Yeah. I was good after the first one. <laughs> is that is that our logging crew? Have we covered them all. I think so. I think so. It's hard because yeah. everyone looks like a typical 70s man, so it's kind of hard to tell them apart <laughs> at times. Uh, 70s man. How do you describe 70s man? Uh, wow. Long shaggy hair, shitty beards, beards, trucker yeah. hats, flannel shirts. And if they're not wearing flannel, they're wearing like 80s band t-shirts like Fleetwood Mac and Aerosmith yep. and stuff. I got chainsaws. <laughs> so this is uh, it takes place in Snowflake, Arizona. Uh, actually filmed in Oregon, apparently, because it looks like Pacific Northwest. I yeah, my whole, trees. yeah, I haven't seen this since I saw it in the theater, and I'm like, yeah, it takes place in the Pacific Northwest somewhere. And then they're like, Arizona. I'm like, what? But okay. Uh, so what happens to these guys? What's the story I've of this been to movie? Arizona, so I believed it. Actually, should we? I mean, because the movie is kind of um, the construction of the movie is a mystery, right? Is that what we're going in for here? It's a it's a mystery thriller. Yes, but I feel like if you are buying a ticket to this movie, you probably already know what the mystery is. You know what I'm saying? Like, I th- yeah. I knew what the whole story was, so it wasn't a mystery to me, but I don't well, know. And, you- yeah, and like just the opening credits, it's like based on the story by, and it says his name. It's like, okay, so you know he survives. Like, he, so, yeah. you know he's coming back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they shouldn't, uh, they should have saved that credit for the end because that would have been a little more surprising. They might have just assumed that everyone knew. I don't know. Probably. It was a big story at the time. Yeah. Or back in the day. It was a known story. Yeah. So what's the uh, story, Michaela? What do we got going on here? Well, how does it, how do, how do we ease into this? How's the movie doing this? What's our technique? So we, we follow these like six forestry workers at the, on their day job, going into the woods, cutting shit up with chainsaws. And there's a lot of tension between them because it's just a lot of like raging hick testosterone. 
<laughs> and like a need to constantly prove themselves, I guess. So there's a lot of my tension. chainsaw is bigger than your chainsaw. Like, they, yeah, they literally that's try to like it. chainsaw fight each other. <laughs> like, that's how stupid this gets. Like, I feel like this is not a great portrait of like forestry workers at all. I feel like this makes them look, look really bad. <laughs> I don't know. This might be an accurate portrayal of forestry workers. We don't know. <laughs> I've never met one. Holly's the closest thing right now. I know. <laughs> And uh, they're leaving work one day all in their pickup truck and they see what looks like a fire in the sky and it is like a giant glowing red sky. They drive towards it and there's this big kind of like gelatinous type orb in the air Uh, and Travis Walton gets out of the car and runs under it and throws him around a bit, knocks him unconscious and they take off. Looks like a mushroom. Yeah, it's like a a mushroom in the sky. It looked Don't like, say veiny egg. You know what it looked That's like what it to looks me? Like. It looked like uh, like uh, magma. You know, like lava. Yeah, hot magma. right. Hot, hot magma. Liquid hot magma. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We all know that. Yeah, <laughs> it'll never go away. Austin Powers lives on. <laughs> um, yeah. So this is the thing, I guess, that you always have when you get into these kind of movies. You always say like, okay. And I was thinking about this when we were watching it. It's like. At some point, you have seen what you consider to be like the definitive version of the uh, alien spacecraft, you know, or or something like that. And so, uh, the task of every filmmaker is to come in and like, okay, we're gonna we got to do something that they haven't seen before. Uh, but you're always kind of saddled with that, like, is this, oh, you know, it's but you're tr- you're trying to get the one where like if somebody's like, I, mean, I imagine if it happened, it it happened like that. Uh, how close was this uh, for you with the, uh, you know, well, was the, it, I mean, was it a creative choice or was it based on his description in his book? A lot of this movie was based on the description in his book. Um, especially the design of the aliens. Some mm-hmm. of the stuff that happens to him once he is abducted is exaggerated for the movie. Um, okay. but yeah, I, I'm sure he keeps some things back cause he wants you to buy his book though. Sure. Yeah. There's a documentary on him, I think, called like Travis Walton or something like that. It popped up. Uh, we watched this on Amazon Prime, and it showed up next in my uh, my queue. Um, so, but the movie starts off. Uh, it's a the it's it's poised as a mystery, which I kind of liked about it because it was like you know it reveals stuff to you. You have questions as you're watching it because you just see these guys coming barreling out of the woods. Uh, very moody opening where it's like, is that an alien right there coming to the light coming out of the woods? No, it's truck headlights as, as they race to the local bar and they go in and they're all very suspicious looking and they have to make that call to the police and bring the police and then the inspectors in. I like that scene that we pointed out during the, the while we were watching it as we see James Garner's character taking the call in his car and he's on his way. He stops and we, you know, and we see these lights on his uh, the views, the windscreen coming down red lights and it's like oh my god is there aliens like right now and it turns out it's a trail uh, you know train crossing, crossing. Uh, <laughs> that's a good fake out yeah that was a good fake really out good. i appreciated that so i'm like was yeah, that written that way was that somebody actually you know getting into the headspace of the audience watching that i'm like that's a good direction right yeah there. that's a good move <laughs> you've thought and, about uh, this <laughs> And a tip to Close Encounters, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. The Roy Neary sequence out there by the uh, the train tracks. By the train tracks, yep. So the whole thing here is the guys relate their story to the in- investigator, and um, this becomes like the central crux of the movie, I guess, is we're wondering, did these guys, are they covering up, did they kill Travis Walton, <laughs> or was he right? actually abducted? by a ufo from the space the space yeah. now now again like we knew that he was coming back because we knew that it's his story but i like the way they set it up because you don't know how far it's gonna go you know like as far as them being accused and like the town turning against them like, you don't know how far they're going to go with that. So that was the compelling part. And I did appreciate that. I thought it added a nice cinematic touch to the story. I really kind of felt like their panic and desperation in that moment when Dallas is kind of going on that ranch being like, you know, they don't need to have a body to charge for murder. And we know they're never going to find him. So we're all right. fucked. Like, yeah, that was a great I, scene. I, I that's my worst nightmare. That. Like, that's, 
that's a really good take on this. It's like, okay, we know they're innocent because, you know, obviously he lives and we know like the story, like the general setup of the story, but the fact that we don't know how far they're going to take it and how far they're going to get in trouble. Like that was the part that it's like, Oh Jesus. Like that's, I don't know. I thought it was good storytelling. Yeah. And this is, uh, um, it, it's, it is good storytelling. It's, um, the way they do it is nice because it makes, I think it makes you pay attention to the movie more because we don't know what's going on. And so we're watching these characters and we're also, um, whether you, you know it or not, you're waiting for them to be just alone with each other to see how they speak to each other to like get clues. I'm like, all right, that conversation those three had was just like, okay, you're paying attention because you're like, is shit can be revealed here? What did they do? Yeah. They're still not saying much, but they're saying a lot about other shit. Like it's yeah. really well done up to that point. Like if you're, you know, the alien stuff doesn't kind of happen until the back end of the movie. But I think this is like, this is good enough to get us there. Like it's, yeah, it's, and even, and even like the, the reveal of the, the craft, it takes a hot minute for us to actually see it come on screen. So like the suspense of like when they're actually going to show it, it had me hanging for, for a while. I thought that was a oh, nice the, touch. Yeah. Too. You're talking about the scene. The, yeah. Cause it's, it, they do like a, um, it's almost the way that Steven Spielberg will shoot stuff. I, you know, yeah. I always recognize this as part of his style where you have the characters reacting to something off screen, but the, the movie doesn't actually cut to it for a while, you know? So you're just kind of seeing them in awe and pointing and like, what's that over there? There's these great shots that have, you know, of like the car driving through the night and you can see the fire in the sky, you know, uh, off in the distance. And it's all like, you know, it's not a visual effect. They just have a big light up there or something, but, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's effective stuff. You know I mean? It's really yeah. well, uh, put together, well shot. This is one of those yeah. movies that kind of feels like, you know, they had the budget for the vision that they had. It doesn't feel like it's like, well, they had to cut corners there. It's like, everything does kind of feel like, Oh, they were actually able to do everything that they wanted to pull off. You yeah. Know? And I, I feel like they, couldn't afford Spielberg, so they got as close as they could. Well, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and this guy did all right because his transitions yeah. were pretty good. I liked his transitions of you know Dallas lighting the cigarette and uh, or he's about to in the interrogation, and then that takes you into the next uh, flashback. So the, the movie's told in a series of flashbacks or several flashbacks as we get the full story of what actually happened. You know, we get to see the. Uh, the life that these guys have uh, Mike and Travis are best friends who uh, want to go off and uh, start a, a Harley Davidson business. Uh, Travis is going to get married to Mike's sister. There's tension in the Mike Rogers household. And then when Travis disappears and all this kind of attention is focused on this town, this is like uh, overnight, right? All the UFO people and reporters and like the, 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 town swells to like a population of like several hundred <laughs> overnight mm -hmm. and everybody's looking at them it's a very like not a paranoid movie but it does kind of put you in the subjective point of view of these guys as they're going through their day-to-day -day business and like all their friends are now looking at them going staring like, at them yeah well there aren't aliens mike so what really happened up there <laughs> you know right. even his wife you know that was a pretty good scene. Uh, Kathleen uh, Will Hoyt. Will Hoyt? Will, Will Hoyt. I'm not sure how you say her last name. You'll know her from Roadhouse. And Gilmore Girls. And the Gilmore Girls. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, there's that scene where, you know, she, she's like, so are you going to tell me what really happened? He's like, I told you everything. I did actually tell you. What do you think about, uh, I mean. Uh, well, and Robert. she's like the bank's calling three times a day being like, where's the damn mortgage? And you're trying to get me on this alien story, like priorities. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause that's another year you got, you, you know, these guys are living paycheck to paycheck and their livelihoods are threatened because nobody wants to employ them. Once you start talking about aliens. All right. This really? Is, that's uh, a, that's a clear indicator that I need to hire that guy. Cause we got, you know, we have stuff to talk about. Yeah. And you could be, I mean, think of the advertising. But this, of course, becomes the angle. So um, the investigator, right, he's working the angle that there's a there's been a murder here and just don't know why, you know, Mike Rogers, the stand up dude is covering for one of his crew uh, and they suspect who who's the main primary suspect. Yeah. 
Alan Dallas. This is Craig Sheffer's character. <laughs> and uh, so he's basically the bandana wearing, um, you know, like, what would you say? He's the bad apple in the bunch. He's the most redneck of them all, for sure. He's got hell in, he's got hell in his eyes. <laughs> the man with hell in his eyes. That boy's got hell in his eyes. <laughs> yeah, he's the rough and tumble guy. He's got a record, of course, so uh, they immediately suspect him. All of these actors, man, I just like, they're all doing like really solid work in this yeah. movie. I was going to, I was watching this and I was like, I forgot Craig Shepard's a good actor. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's doing a good job. Well, this was definitely like a prestige attempt at this type of movie, right? Like this was like, they were trying to get Oscars with this and really be serious about it. There's well, nothing goofy about this movie. No, I mean, it's serious. I mean, it had, like I said, it's got James Garner in it. You know, I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, I mean, the way I remember it in 1992 or 1993, I think when it came out was just, you know, it's like, well, and this week there's fire in the sky. Uh, it was just kind of like another thing, but I mean, now watching it, it's like, well, it's obviously paramount. It's made by professionals. It's, you know, it's like, this is, uh, you know, I mean, one of their self-financed releases of the year, you know? Um, so they had faith in it, obviously, um, there's a tag at the end that tells us that in February of the year this movie came out that the uh, group uh, took a, a second lie detector test. We're going to tell you about the results of the first one in a minute. But, uh, Michaela, I don't know. Did you look into that? I mean, was that actually – did that happen in February of 2013? That did happen at some point. I don't know if that's when it happened. But then there was also – someone else came out later saying that they did – that that wasn't true and some were inconclusive – there's a lot of people saying all things on both sides in this situation. Yeah. Cause I had heard, uh, you know, the, the Travis Walton took a lie detector test that came back negative, like on a, a TV show recently. Right. Wasn't it like on, it was on some public forum. Yeah, It was really recent. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't we disprove the, certainty of lie detector tests at some point aren't they like yeah it's very not? easy to pass or fail it's, it's yeah. very easy to fake it yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't put any credence in you, the results of those the, things you remember the scene in oceans 11 when he's got the tack in his shoe mm-hmm. yeah right. that yeah. easy yeah. there's a reason they don't hold up in court as evidence you know yeah mm-hmm. you know who invented the polygraph john polygraph uh, oh ron hubbard Okay, well, I don't remember his name, but you will know him as the creator of Wonder Woman. He invented the polygraph? He invented the polygraph. She has the lasso of truth. Is it the lasso of truth? Is that what it is? Yeah. So there you go. I need his name. I don't know if Captain Google can uh, can look that up, but... uh, It's William something. I know there was a book about him that came out like a year or two ago. Yeah. Created the character Wonder Woman. Boom. See, you listen to the Saturday Night Freak Show, you're going to get your head all full. You know, you're saying, well, I know the name, Colin. Why don't you know? That's what they're asking about there. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> uh, Dick. <laughs> so the uh, William <laughs> Moulton Marston is his name. Sorry, say again. William Moulton Marston. He there. sounds like a character in Red Dead Redemption. <laughs> there you go. Um, so yeah, the noose is tightening around these guys. They're shunned in their, uh, you know, um, in small town life. Uh, marriage is disintegrating, all this stuff, uh, you know, relatives coming in. There's searches, of course. The police are doing searches for Travis. Uh, they can't find him. Um, and so basically the first section of the movie, I think, leads to the construction of the movie is to basically lead us to the polygraph, <laughs> right? Because it's like the polygraph is like, that's the big act break. And then they take the polygraph. There's a bunch of like, are we going to take it? Are, are you bought off polygraph, man? You know, that you're going to give us a fair because they don't believe anything that's happening. Uh, you know, people are all out to get them. So they take the polygraph. What does the polygraph show? Tell them the well, at first they said, we're not going to talk, talk about the results. After they talk about one of the results, they say, well, we're not going to talk about them. But one of them was inconclusive. They won't say what the rest are. To the guys. Come back for a second day. But yeah, but law enforcement speaks among themselves and they say what? They come back. I don't what positive. Would you say positive? I don't understand. I don't know the link. <laughs> this sort of test. <laughs> yeah. Proves that they were telling the truth. The polygraph does. It says all these yeah. boys are there and say they're telling the truth. So 
That launches us. What, into what was the- that calling? Is that your <laughs> that your southern accent there? Well, it boils down the truth. It boils down the truth. <laughs> if you believed it, then yes. Um, that's why I need my ten gallon hat for that. Uh, Please. So Please. this, so, but mm-hmm. then a surprising development happens in the movie, right about now. What is it? I forgot his name. Travis. Travis shows back up. Travis comes back. He comes back naked. And I, I loved the little detail though that he had been calling like all night long, and they didn't answer because they thought it was the bank calling about their mortgage. <laughs> can we just, can we just talk about the fact that this poor man has been abducted? Well. Well, you know, abducted by aliens, and these people have no idea how to handle it, like none whatsoever. This poor man is just like traumatized, and everyone handles it in the worst way, like for the next year. Who would though? How do you how do you deal with that? Well, but but like if you find someone naked, dehydrated on the side of the road in a rainstorm, hospital is the first place you should go. Yes, yes. The cops, like, hey, I'm wanted for murder. Here's my proof that I did not murder anyone. They'd be the I, first one I call. Fuck the hospital. If he but dies in the call? hands of the cops, I'm still innocent. Yeah, but who do they call? These idiots. Who do they call? They call. Oh, this was far? done. The, yeah, a far. What was it? The American. I, yeah, it, basically, <laughs> it, they, they call a like paranormal when he, group. When he introduced himself, he's like, "Yes, I'm from afar." I'm like, "Whoa, boy, are you?" <laughs> 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 it's, yep. uh, it's odd group. He is uh, the UFOologist who appears in the town and you know hands out a business card like I we have experience with this kind of thing. Um, <laughs> Why does he look like that one Nazi doctor from every Indiana Jones movie? Yeah, well, he looks like a G man or something, right? He's yeah, all like yeah. yeah. Um, even though it's 1975, but he looks like he stepped right out of the 1950s. And uh, and well, I mean, who do you call? You know, you call the guy who has the experience with the. They don't have 911 back then. So they got to call the UFOologists who come and uh, to, you know try to interview Travis as he because we got to get the information right after he's uh, discovered. But and Sean, I you almost... want him alive as long as possible, so you want to get him to the hospital, and then you call the cops once he's at the hospital. You want to keep that yeah. man alive. I know. I, I well, someone needs to see that he's alive. Is the first not not the fucking UFO dudes. Like, no, this was this almost ruined the movie for me because when yeah. I saw them show up and they were the first ones he called, I'm like, what? Well, no. No, yeah. this, it's the only thing in an alien abduction movie that did not make sense <laughs> to me, me. It did it not ring true. Really, it made me really angry, and it made me even more angry that it doesn't come back around. Yeah. Like, that's, like they're we, done. This like, could that's have, it. We could have cut, yeah, we could have cut straight to him having a little freak out and waking up and not had these dudes involved. Well, we just weird. had the scene where the guy introduced the, you know, gave him the, the business card that had to pay off. He called them, and I suppose you have to kind of satisfy the idea of the alien uh, expert, you know, it's somewhere in your story, you have to satisfy that sure. idea that there's, you know, I, I will go with that, sure. but you satisfy that after you get him to the hospital, that man needed an IV. Yeah. Cause he's, he's clearly dehydrated for five days. Yeah. Cause that's what they say, right? Uh, we established that he's been gone. For, he was gone for five days. Um, apparently with no food, no water for that period of time, they take him to the hospital and, uh, that's where he finds out because Mike is trying to, uh, you know, coax him because he's basically catatonic at this point. And Mike says, you know, it's like, uh, you know, when we went back for you, I couldn't find you. I like went out of my mind. And uh, that's when Travis responds and says, went back. You left me there. <laughs> yeah. Can we just can we just clear this up? Would you have left or would you have gotten out of the damn truck and checked on your friend and tried to get him? Which, what would you have done? I think, well, I don't know well, if you guys wanna... first of all, you, know, you can't, my friend, so <laughs> you can't, you can't know. I don't know. I think certain situations you can't know until you're in it. You could say what you want all day long, but until you're there and you react, I don't know. I mean, they saw I'd the like thing throw him across the, gr- right. you know, throw him in the air. So who knows what would happen to them? I'd be scared sure. shitless, but I wouldn't like, I think I'd get away from it. But I'd watch it and try and figure out what's going on. But I don't think I would just drive away. But I don't know. Well, I, I feel like I'd be too paralyzed with fear to do anything. Like, yeah, that's, uh, yeah. I think that's the same. Yeah. And you, you're never not mind, thinking never mind. clearly because I think that's what happens there. I think Mike's instinct is to go back for Travis, right? This is his best mm-hmm. friend. But he's in a 
very tight confined pickup truck with like five yeah. other guys and they are freaked out yelling and yeah. want to get the hell out of there and so, so he drives so like i don't a, think he's so even like thinking a, at that point he just hits the like fucking fighter, pedal it's like a fight or flight situation and then after yeah. he has a minute to think about it he's like fuck i should go back yeah 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 okay i'll give okay i'll yeah. go with that so he does I go back, back and leaves the rest of them there and he says he couldn't find you know anything i take back my answer i'm mike no i'm i'm travis like I'm the one who got out of the car to be like, oh, you'd be the one <laughs> starting the whole problem in the first I, place. Yeah, I'd be the All one right. who gets abducted. That's, so out of, I, out of us, Sean's the one getting out. Who's coming to get my ass? And we're the ones leaving him, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm sitting in the back seat, which is with a thousand yard stare, unable to do anything. <laughs> there you go. I'll come back, uh, Sean, after I take them to safety. As being oh, a I responsible of, driver. <laughs> Your curiosity, Colin, I think you'd come back. Yeah. I think Holly would stay in the car too. And I think Michaela would be in the back <laughs> mumbling to herself. Be like, <laughs> that's, yeah. and then I they would pinpoint me be. because I would be the most weird about it afterwards. <laughs> I'm right. one targeted. Right. Your your little line cut at the end would be, and Michaela was just never the same. And that's it. Yeah. That's all we know about you. <laughs> Well, this moment sets up a, a, a schism between the two friends because uh, Travis now thinking that Mike left him uh, is, you know, he's like, he basically turns over in the bed. He doesn't want to talk to him. And so then Mike hey, I, exits the movie. This is unfair, for, though. Like, Mike did the best he possibly could given the situation. What yeah, I don't blame Mike. What fucking do? Yeah. Well, but I think that's the catharsis in the movie. Like later on, that is the final scene, right? Is the, the you know Travis does say, "I've been thinking about it for apparently two years. It took him two years, but okay, to come around to it." But he basically comes around to that idea. That, Colin, you know, he was a human anal probe. He needed to get over it. <laughs> he needed to come to terms with it. <laughs> yeah. And he finally did. Well, we're working up to it, but this is like the reason that because uh, uh, Michaela had said like, should we should we watch Fire in the Sky? And I'm like, yeah, you should. And then I was like, oh, what's going to happen? Because like the first half of this movie is like no aliens, right? It 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 does it pretty well. It like basically it has a lot of intrigue, but you're like, I came for an alien movie, and I'm getting the you know, uh, right. yeah. I'm getting the, I'm getting the <laughs> lifetime a little bit drama. I will say that the most of this movie, I was like, why are we watching this? Why yeah, are is we this a freak this? show movie? And then, we, <laughs> and then we get to the aliens and I'm like, this is why we're watching this movie. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So how do we get there? Set us up. He, are they eating breakfast and he has a freak out? They're like having a welcome face, back right? party. Yeah, it's, he like comes a, home. it's like a welcome back potluck. Yeah. yeah. Well, we see when he comes back, he's got like scars on the side of his eyes and on his face. And he looks kind of like like, he got beat up and you're going like, what the fuck happened to this guy? What happened to his eyes? You know? And this is this is what I'm referring to when they're all handling it very poorly. Like this dude is traumatized and they have this big welcome back party with like 50 people in his house. Mm -hmm. It is 1975. They don't know what PTSD is. I know. That's true. Yeah, I know. So, they're like he'll feel more at home because everybody will be all his friends are going to be there. It's going to be happy. So let's good, bring time. in everyone he's ever known. If you yeah. just smother him, he'll go back to normal. Yeah, right. but apparently oh, Travis geez. freaks out, you know, as you do, and ends up hiding when underneath cabin the kitchen table. On your face, you freak out. Yeah, <laughs> I mean that was gross. I was like, ooh, I, I like syrup, and I was put off by that. I was yeah. Like, yeah, the syrup like that. rolls off the top of the, or spills off the top of the uh, table and lands on his mouth, which triggers like a fifteen-minute showpiece centerpiece of this movie. Never uh, has syrup been so tense. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> Seriously, so, the way they kept cutting back to it, I was like, "What?" <laughs> I'm oh, like, what, does he blow up if it touches him? <laughs> <laughs> As it slowly fills the screen, rolling toward the camera, or I was going to be like going in his eyes, like ah, oh, my eyes. Yeah. Like, what? It actually what did give me a trigger? really great idea for a movie, though. I was thinking, what if you made like a schlocky, like B level horror movie about like the Great Molasses Flood? <laughs> And then there's like generational trauma where people are triggered by seeing molasses like that. <laughs> they, say, they say that that area, you can still get hints of like really? molasses. You smell it. No, it's yeah. still there. Yeah. Why is there a movie made about this? <laughs> really? That's a great point. I love that story. We need to explore this. Let's write it. Let's there write it. Go. Copyright yeah. 2020, Sarah. We, need, show. we, need we haven't had many first. this year. <laughs> That's true. We haven't. So tell us about the alien sequence. What? Ha- how do we get into it? What happens? Travis wakes up on board an alien ship. In a cocoon. 
It's like a stretchy, like skin cocoon, but it, there's like KY jelly everywhere, but it's like dirty brown jelly. <laughs> Yeah, and it's really it, we keep cutting to like his hands going into it, you know, as he's grasping around and he's like putting his hands into this goo and you're like, Bleh, what the yeah. fuck? The whole thing has this very textile feeling to it uh, about, you know, it's just oogie, right? Which, I mean, they keep on cutting to these close-ups of his hands going into crap and shit. And the sounds just... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has to break out of this membrane. Uh, the aliens use some kind of like veiny technology because they have what appears to be like circuits or something on the surface of this membrane, but it's like the veins or something. It's kind of cool production design. Back yeah. to that veiny egg, right, Sean? Stop it. Yeah. <laughs> you knew I was going to tell him to not say that. <laughs> well, he breaks out of this cocoon and then we get zero G sequences, which. Uh, I, I'm always kind of impressed by these when they pull them off with like wire work and stuff like that. Cause now everybody's like, well, Tom Cruise fucking, you know, we got to go up or, uh, Apollo 13. Now we have to actually go up in the vomit comet and do it for real. Like, no, they can look at this. <laughs> Those glasses spinning that he, tra- that he kicked or oh, whatever. That was cool. Yeah. That was awesome. Like, huh, nice visual effects there. Industrial light and magic. Yeah. It right. has a budget what, big enough to afford industrial light and magic. Mm-hmm. Um, For good. So what does he find in the ship? What's it look like? What's the experience as he well, gets out okay, of this when thing? He's going through this like tunnel in zero G, which is like, it's like a kind of like a honeycomb type thing with all these like membrane sacks and some are open and some are still closed. And he gets like, like he's trying to get his bearings because I mean, I don't know about you, but if I was in this situation, what's one thing that can just make it worse? Oh, there's no gravity, so you can't even just like, you know. <laughs> if there was a giant fan at the top of this thing, that <laughs> would make it worse. I was, thinking, I was like, what if he tries belching? I'm like, would that? Yeah, help? maybe he'll go down. <laughs> I thought he was gonna. I thought he was gonna suck on that uh, umbilical cord for a minute. I'm just like, I, didn't I know. I thought, yeah, yeah, he was gonna. I was like. Where are we going with this? I'm like, is there air just outside up. there? Once you break the membrane, can you breathe? You know, it's like, but apparently you can. There's oxygen. Uh, I like the way that they shot that sequence of him in the cocoon and coming out. They shoot it from a bunch of different angles, so you're not sure which way is up. You know, or is he on his side or on the side of something? Is he laying down? It's very disorienting. And then he's flying around, you know, and pulling himself back with this, uh, uh, whatever, the tentacle thing. Um, and then... He ends up uh, scaling this thing, and gravity, well, of course, that, is flipping as he's. Oh yeah, yeah. He lands in another like pod that has a membrane still on it, and he lands like face first into the rotted torso of some other human being. Yeah, yeah. Hands Ugh. first. It's icky. Right into it. This is again. We're playing up that ick factor to like where it's cranked up to like eight, eight at least at this point, yeah. right? <laughs> like. Ew. Yeah, it's not like a sleek, like modern sci-fi movie. It's very like organic and dirty and just like old and grungy and just like it it's not the sleek, like clean sci-fi you're used to seeing. It, it oh, these are like, these are hillbilly aliens. Yeah, what I are think. these aliens doing? Like Hillbilly this- Aliens, copyright 2020 Saturday <laughs> Free Show. There we go. There you go. Well they so they Sean, do they have uh Sean, do they have a? Uh, like flying saucer saucers up on blocks in their front yards. Yes, yes, they do. <laughs> there we bravo. 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 That's uh yeah, just in space. Just hanging out by a planet. Yeah. I uh, see we have the ideas for this. This is uh, this is a go. <laughs> well they uh just assume they're all wearing wife beaters. <laughs> just assuming. What's the alien wife beater? Just an alien and a wife beater. Okay. It depends on what their torso looks like, I guess, right? Yeah. With a big old trucker hat. Mm-hmm. Well, they, no uh, he, well, this is the thing. He eventually discovers like these, um, he, cause he goes into a, a chamber that has a bunch of like hanging little gray aliens, right? The, uh, what are they called? The grays? I suppose it's small grays. The small grays. Thank mm-hmm. you very much. And, uh, he, he voc, he actually vocalizes at some point. He's like, spacesuits. It's like, oh, you're saying the gray aliens that everybody's familiar with that shape with the big eyes and the those are just spacesuits. That means we're going to we're going to show you what a real alien looks like in this movie because it's based on a true story. And this is we got the, you know, straight from the horse's mouth. This was good when that Mm -hmm. uh, one wakes up behind him. 
Yeah, creepy. And starts coming towards him. Yeah. Because the way they shoot it, he's like out of focus, Michael Myers style in the background, and just its head comes up, and you're like, oh, shit, that one's alive. And then the camera fucking pans away from it, which is even more anxiety inducing, because now you don't know what it's doing. You know, it's there, but you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa." is it coming closer to him? Is it going to get him? And sure enough, taps him on the back. It's like, it was just like tapping to say like, hello or something. He freaks out, kicks the thing in the face, and it's mask comes off so we don't get he was to see actually the- <laughs> he was actually going to be really pleased it's like sir would you mind not touching the seats please thank yeah. you that's what i was thinking yeah he was just uh, that was your first contact right there and he fucked it up old travis fucked it up and uh so he tries to get away down a tunnel and they grab him and yank him back to of course the operating room or whatever the experiment the chamber yeah the alien experiment chamber this scene is horrifying uh yeah it's it's nightmare inducing super intense i remember the uh theatrical experience was like you could you could hear the audience collectively like releasing their breath uh when that scene ended (laughs) it is orchestrated so well they basically you know they take all his clothes then they put him on this table and they put this like I don't know what the fuck you call it. Uh, it's like shrink wrap or something over his they're like, body. Yeah, they're like vacuum seal. <laughs> Which yeah. is like, oh, if you want to hold somebody down on a on a table, I guess that's how you do it. <laughs> I but like they the do way- it over his head. Yeah, oh. yeah, over his face. <laughs> so he's like, oh, oh, this thing's like terrifying. <laughs> onto his that face. That second where you could see it going in his mouth when he was trying to breathe, I was that was awful. <laughs> oh my god, my claustrophobia was like through the roof right yeah i don't know where i've seen it before but that's the image i've seen from this movie like yeah. i've seen in some montage of like a eh, horror movie collection coming out or something like that i've seen that before yeah, all you gotta do is show that that shot and everybody goes oh fire i fucking remember yeah. fire in the sky yeah. god damn it that scene freaked me out and gave me nightmares um sean i have to ask when they took all his clothes off did you think we were finally going to get the anal probing you were asking for <laughs> I mean, uh, I think hoping is a is doing a lot of work in that sense. <laughs> you mentioned that a lot in the chat. You kept bringing yeah. up Angel Grove. I, I just would've... said it was going to happen, and number yeah. two, Colin was right behind me on that one. Not with an Angel Pro. <laughs> right behind you, <laughs> right behind me. I was confused if you were hoping for it or expecting it. Those are expecting two different it. things. Expecting it. Then it flipped around, okay. and I thought. Maybe he's the anal pro. Maybe they're just <laughs> bend over, jamming it up each other's asses. It's well, because like, that ah, cocoon gotta, does kind of look like it, it could be inside of an intestinal tract. Maybe. They're like, we got a bad human again. Ugh, go get another one. Yeah, it is kind of gross. Now you're not going to be able to watch so this gross. movie the same way. It's like he wakes up in <laughs> yeah. an alien's rectum. Um, <laughs> right. Just think of that when you're watching this movie. <laughs> well, they end up, then they make it worse because then they come at him with a scalpel. And you're like, what the fuck are they going to do now? And they're going near his eye with the scalpel. But it turns out it's just yeah. to cut like a little opening around one of his eyes. Then they cut the mouth so he can breathe. Then they shove a bunch of fucking dirty jelly in it in his mouth. And then they clamp this thing Brown on. Brown jelly. And then they put what the fuck? Some big ass tube that they're like intravenously like shoving yeah. down his. Uh, and then they put like a, like a they put like a clockwork orange like thing on his eye to make his eye stay open, which oh, fills God. up with some kind of pus. They put like, like a milky oh. fluid over his eye. That was so uh, awful. <laughs> that whole, I'm, I'm, so I'm muting awful. you guys. I don't want to hear this again. Oh. And then it gets worse because much like that scene in uh, whatever uh, uh, Star Wars, right with the the um, the truth droid with the needle the, yeah we, we get this contraption that comes down the aliens also like zombie the piece of wood in the eye and uh zombie oh yeah ocular trauma this is always a thing uh that you can rely on well but the movie did set it up because you're always wondering like what where did those bruises come from has to have something happen to his eye and this is the thing apparently the aliens want to because they hook up like something to his neck and to his mouth so they're getting like readings on what they're about to do (laughs) to him. And this thing like unfolds in graphic close up as his needle comes closer and closer to the camera. And the music is like building in this fucking intensity. It's like, Oh Jesus Christ. How do you get out of this? And then thank God it cuts to him waking up. uh, uh, I I was watching it and I was like, Oh sweet Jesus. Cut away, cut away, cut away. (laughs) I was so thankful when it did. (laughs) That's pretty intense. What what about what do you think of the aliens in this? They're creepy. Sean, what do they look like? I mean, they look like Groots. They, <laughs> they just all look, look like a bunch of 
they look like a bunch of Groots, but they do. They're they're creepy Groots. Like yeah. I would not be yeah. ha- I would not be happy to be around them. And they all look um, agitated, which is not good. Yeah, I I, I kind of like this. Oh, that's good. I like when they do the different alien. They're not all. I mean, I like the 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 little grays and all that stuff. This is good too. They're just kind of like they're they're stickly, like they're very like thin looking, except for their big heads. I mean, you know how aliens are, but they're just uh, yeah, they're Groot looking. Yeah, they're yeah. they're puppets, um, but I mean, like very detailed, fleshy, skin textured. You know, they're kind of they're human, but not. You know, they have like a yeah. human colored flesh, but they're you know misshapen. So it's just kind of like what the fuck. And I mean, I thought that it was like I mean, I believe that they were there. You know, it was kind of one of those. I'm like, this is actually working. They, like those actually look like a, you know yeah, aliens doing did. shit to this guy. Like nice, bravo. You don't yeah, have to yeah. see much, but yeah. No, they shot it and cut it in a way where, like, uh, I didn't see anything that would make me believe that I'm watching, like, movie magic. Like, you know, nothing, no scenes, no nothing, no weird stuff, no strings. Look good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was looking at, like, the puppeteers and stuff, but I confess I didn't recognize anybody who was involved in this and you know i'm sorry if they may be like you know titans in their field but there was a credit for like the alien you know the uh uh, whatever the alien ship scene was uh, conceptualized by uh somebody at uh ilm um yeah all that's uh uh, good stuff very uh intense um and then uh you know he uh travis wakes up from this uh, because this is basically this is his memory has been unlocked at this point right and he remembers what happened to him. So I guess then, you know, everything after this is kind of gravy. What What's the fallout for from these revelations? Uh, who's, well, all right, they're innocent. What is the fallout? I don't remember. Yeah, I kind of was still recovering from this scene, I feel like, for the rest of the movie. <laughs> well, True. That's basically it. Until that, he turned into Forrest Gump at the end. <laughs> Yeah, well, at some point it flashes forward. Yeah, it, well, the scene after immediately following that is uh, uh, James Garner and Noble Will- Willingham uh, part ways because it's basically you get you kind of get the idea. James Garner still thinks this is a hoax. These That's guys have right. planned it. Travis had five days off in the wild to you know concoct this That's story. Right. They're trying yeah, to get out of their. Talk. Yeah, they yeah, want to get out of their mining it- contract and pay off. You know, get the 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 fame and fortune of uh, being alien abductees. Yeah. Cause James, they said earlier, James Garner's character was like known for not having like an unsolved case. Like he has solved every case he's ever had. And at this point he's like, I don't believe their shit. I'm going to be back when I can like nail this. Yeah. Yeah. But the sheriff is like, you know, it's like they said the polygraph said it was true. Ever the doctors seem to believe him. Like, well, how far do you want to go? So you kind of have that classic skeptic, and believer scene right there at the end. It's like, well, you can pick which one of these guys you side with and you know, you, uh, you still are satisfied by the movie. And then, yeah, it jumps to two years in the future. And we find out, uh, I guess, because the central dynamic is what happened to Mike and Travis, you know, uh, what's their story. Mm-hmm. Travis, it turns out is uh, recovered pretty well from the experience is doing well for himself. He married Mike's sister. They've got a kid with another one on the way. Um, but Mike, uh, yeah, he's gone and he's off living in the woods with, uh, you know, Mike didn't recover from this. No, no. Although he's got a pretty sweet cabin in the woods. That's right. But he's <laughs> antisocial and doesn't want to talk to anybody and probably doesn't want to be bothered by this. And he's haunted by the, you know, the whole experience. Travis shows up and takes him for a ride. Let's go for a ride, which is always like, you know, good thing he's not in the mafia. Cause that'd be, you know. You don't get the car. Right. <laughs> uh, but they go back to the scene of the abduction. And, um, and uh, yeah, Travis is like, yeah, it's totally my fault. I got out of the car. Shouldn't have got out of the car. <laughs> there you go, Sean. Shouldn't have got out of the car. Sean, don't, remember that. Yeah, don't say you didn't learn anything from the Saturday Night I Free was show. compelled. <laughs> the, next time we're, <laughs> the next time we're all driving in the countryside and we see an alien spacecraft, do not get out of the truck. I will remember. Okay. I will so you remember. take your own advice. Right. You call. You call somebody. Call afar. They'll take care of it. That's what they do. Right. Yeah. Do we get the phone number from the card? Yeah. <laughs> five, five, five. Oh, one, Whatever seven, else. six. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So, I mean, that basically wraps up the movie. Uh, this is uh, from the era where you had the crawl at the end that tells you what everybody was has done since. And it says, like, Travis and his wife are still living. He's like a, what is he? He, he owns a company. Foreman. Or no, he's a foreman at a mill. And Mike, in 1990-something, eventually got a job as a logger again. So everything's okay with him. And uh, who knows mm-hmm. what happened to the other guys. Yeah. I don't know if it's okay with well, him, but he has a steady job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, they, well, that's when they all came back, as we mentioned earlier. <clears throat> in 1993, they all came back and took the polygraph again, and they all passed. Well, only three. Came well, not back, all of them. Not all of them. Three, which came is back, weird, sorry. yeah, because it was basically the three, you know, central people in the in the story. So it was Mike, Travis, and Dallas retook the test. Dallas was the one with the inconclusive um, result. So yeah, but after all that time, you can convince yourself a story is true. Yeah, polygraph test. That's how you pass it. If you believe your own lies, you can pass a polygraph test. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. Psychos need not apply. So tell you what, listener, we're going to tell you if you should watch this movie we just described for you, which is Fire in the Sky. But first of all, we're going to answer some of your mail about Fire in the Sky, and in order and our other episodes. And to do that, we're going to have to summon our mailman, and his name is Igor. Igor, bring us the mail. Masters, masters, the mail. I've got the mail. So many letters. Our followers are rising, rising. Why, thank you, Igor. 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 (laughs) Igor. (laughs) Do you think he came from a fire in the sky? He just got dropped here one day? That would explain a lot. Um, I'll bet he got no. I'll bet he got abducted and t- brought back say, real quick. He's, I was going to say he was abducted and he's just never been the same since. <laughs> yeah, he looked like us before. Now, Ooh. yeah, that explains who, why you are the way you are. Igor. I think he went up as a whole person and he came back as a bunch of different people. To tell you the truth, <laughs> yeah. Well, we want to remind the good folks at home how they can get a hold of us and participate in our exciting mailbag segment. All you got to do is follow along on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Saturday Night Freak Show. Or Twitter. At Sat Freak Show. You can email us. Saturday Night Freak Show at Yahoo.com. And you can follow along on Instagram. We're at Saturday Night Freak Show. We got a review this week. Ooh. Peter Neal. <laughs> Peter <laughs> Neal says, I discovered this podcast in March and have been an acolyte ever since. During this quarantine, especially, they've had an unparalleled run of episodes matched only by Led Zeppelin in its prime <laughs> consistency wise. Good banter, knowledgeable hosts, passionate discussion, the whole package. Half of Vinegar Syndrome's yearly revenue comes from these guys, so we should support these stewards of boutique Blu-ray industry, of the the boutique Blu-ray industry. Yeah, sponsor us, fucking Vinegar Syndrome. Sponsor us. I got enough of your... I got enough of your cat movies, Vinegar Syndrome. All right, sponsor us. Did Home Person really just compare us to Led Zeppelin? Yeah, yeah. Peter Neal. Peter Neal. Those of you in the know will remember is the uh, he's the author in Tenebrae, Dario Argento's Tenebrae, which we also did on this show. All right. right. Uh, (laughs) About tonight's episode. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very yes, much. Yes, thank you. Uh, about tonight's episode, which was Fire in the Sky, Michael Whitaker writes in and says, Oh, man, this movie began my intense but short-lived obsession with alien abductions. I bought books, watched movies, or any TV special about them. There was a lot of them in the 90s, and the movie still holds up, I think, even if now I've become more of a skeptical skeptic on the subject. Anybody see... Uh, alien abduction or no alien autopsy you remember alien autopsy no No. yeah i think so the fox broadcasting network aired an hour long or maybe it was a two hour. i think jonathan frakes hosted it it purported to be footage that they had found of the roswell uh well they think uh, an abduction er, right an autopsy of the roswell alien and they brought in the stan winston and his crew to basically look at the footage and say, like, could you fake it? And Stan Winston said, it looks real to me. And then, of course, like the next day, everybody debunked the shit out of the fucking thing. And, and you're like, Stan, Stan, Stan. let me down, Stan. Stan. <laughs> Stan. <laughs> Why are we bringing in Stan Winston? I know. Don't blame Stan. I Leave mean, if, if you're going to do that, you also need to bring in like a zoologist. You know, you got to bring in yeah. both. You got to have the science perspective and the special. Oh, yeah, they had everybody, but that one stood out because I'm like, I know who Stan Winston is. 
Stan Winston's vouching for this. Amazing. Uh, Steve. Stan Winston probably made it. There you go. Yeah. Uh, Steve Cote says, I had a chance to meet Travis Walton in 2013. Travis says over the years, he's met hundreds of skeptics determined to disprove his story. But he says he's passed psychiatric tests and lie detector tests, and he has a raft of evidence to prove his experience is true. There's also a very good documentary on Amazon Prime about his experiences. Well, there you go. There you go. Good stuff. Mm. Awesome. Mm. Thanks for writing in. Yeah. Yes. I know he does a lot of, like, conventions and stuff, or at least he did pre-COVID, so. He's still making that sweet, sweet cheddar off of the Walton experience. This puts me in the mind like (laughs) That's sweet anal probe money. Yeah. Sitting here in front of a microphone and we're talking about alien abductions. And I think it's only appropriate that we mention Art Bell, <laughs> who basically through this period of time from midnight coast to coast radio AM. Art Bell? Anybody? Like oh, yeah. As a with- kid, I used to listen to that, like when I would fall asleep at night. Yeah. And I don't know. That's probably why I have anxiety now. I shouldn't be listening now. It's <laughs> that shit when you're trying to fall asleep. But In the land of nigh. Is George so Neary still doing that show? I think so. Yeah. Art Bell's in. voice is weirdly comforting to me now because of that. Yeah. Sure. Um, Leamy72 says, Fire in the Sky is one of my all-time favorites. Funny, I was just referencing this movie on Thanksgiving. There was a spicy jelly dish that looked like the stuff they put in his mouth, but it was delicious. Uh, great film. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you going for Thanksgiving that they're serving a spicy jelly dish that mm, looks like mm, that? Mm, mm, mm. Spicy jelly. Is it an aspic? Could be savory, savory jelly. Yeah, yeah. we talked about that yeah, on one that of the our episodes. Aspics are the, like the meat jellies, like they're from from the fifties. The fifties was real big on like meat jello molds. Yeah, Holly, you could take your veiny eggs and your meat jellies, and you could stop. <laughs> Cheers. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, then we got uh, okay, and Jacob Cotner. He says, "I saw this in the theater, and it was a trip." So. Thank you all for. Oh, and then uh, about last week's episode was it last week we did. No, two weeks ago we did uh, of unknown origin. Uh, Nelson Nascimento writes in and says to continue down the rat hole. That movie's about a giant rat. Uh, enjoy some normal sized horror with Ben and Willard. You guys seen the original Ben and Willard? It's sequel. No, it's no remake with Crispin Glover. Oh, Chris really Glover is a weird dude. Yeah, true. Well, Bruce Davidson's Willard in the first one, and uh, yeah, Crispin Glover in the remake. But uh, yeah, guy who talks to rats. Uh, have you ever looked? Have you ever read any of Crispin Glover's poetry? I need to. <laughs> you know, I can't uh, say that I have. It's fucked up. <laughs> I worked in, with way, girl in what way? No, I worked with a girl that was like obsessed with him, so she brought me like a book of his poetry, and I was like, this dude's messed up. <laughs> That's a very strange person to be obsessed with. Yeah, a weird one. Yeah, she was. I'm more concerned about her. <laughs> she was an odd woman for sure. Yeah, he's an odd anyway, guy. Sorry. Well, uh, Ben Daniel Harris, Daniel Harris. It almost sounds like yeah, we've read Ben stuff here before. He says, "Hey guys, speaking of rat movies, I heard you all mention Deadly Eyes, aka Night Eyes, aka The Rats, which is definitely worth a watch. It was loosely based on the James Herbert book The Rats, which is one of the scariest." books ever i recommend as a one-time watch and we said we can't find streaming but apparently shop factory actually did put it out so we may have to seek out that's a bucket list movie for me as you heard on that episode deadly eyes um so shannon tweed was in um of unknown origin she I was, thought you were going to say Shannon Tweed writes in. Hey, wouldn't that be awesome? Shannon Tweed writes in and says, hey, thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, we said that in a, you know, that was her first movie, right? But she was also the queen of the erotic thriller in the 90s with movies including Night Eyes, Indecent Behavior, Illicit Dreams, Body Chemistry, and Cannibal Women in the Avocado Jungle of Death, which may not have been a uh, erotic thriller, but there's a title. Anyway, Stephen Haynes wrote in. He says, I'm mostly ashamed to say that I've seen most of those. Hey, don't be ashamed. I have no. seen most of them too. Fine. <laughs> those body, those body chemistry ones sound very familiar. Yep. Yeah, I've lie. seen Shannon Tweed's boobs a lot. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> well, some people. That's just who they are. Fine. Sander uh, Antonides says, at her peak in the night in the mid nineties with Andrew Stevens, she was cranking out four to five erotic thrillers a year. 
So yeah, yeah. it is a chance that you get that bread, girl. Yeah. yeah, go for it. Do what you gotta do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Bill Hainer says the trailer for of unknown origin really makes it look like a haunted house movie. I wonder if audiences at the time felt it was a bait and switch. You did watch the trailer. I no, but I'll bet there was a lot of that alien uh, autopsy scene in there that, uh, that <clears throat> on the exam table, but that was cut in there. No, no, a lot. for of unknown origin. No, I know. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Wrong one. Yeah, uh, it does because they they don't tell you that it's a rat, so they they kind of make it like he's alone in the house and there's crazy things and there's yeah, lights and coming we, through windows and stuff like that. It's like a haunted house movie. I think we established on that episode that I was like I had no idea that that's the type of movie we were watching. I thought it was going to be like monster movie, alien movie. I had no idea it was going to be a rat movie. Yeah, uh, Sea Huds. Huds. He writes in, and uh, so we posted a, a photo of uh, from of unknown origin, which had Peter Weller uh, defeated, soaking in a bathtub, just drinking uh, J and B uh, whiskey straight out of the bottle. And uh, C Huds for some people. That's right. And C Huds wants to know: Do people actually drink J and B, or J and B bottles in movies after the seventies always a nod to Giallo movies? Pointy at Colin. I don't know if it's coming across. <laughs> yeah. <it is>. Welcome <laughs> to the secret language of the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast. That's right. Yep. You? <laughs> There's a whole nother conversation going on that you guys don't know about. Uh, it's the world's party whiskey. If you're having a party, you drink J&B whiskey. Uh, uh, Colin, you're the only person I've ever seen drink it, honestly. <laughs> I don't drink whiskey, so... Well, there you go. It, and it appears in a lot of Italian films of the 1970s. G-Money writes in and says, I feel like this, of unknown origin, <laughs> Watchers with Corey Haim and its sequels, and Meet the Applegates were on Channel 5 and 13 all the time growing up in the 90s and all could use a Scream Factory treatment. If some of those come out from Scream Factory, I'm not sure. I think of Unknown Origin has for sure. Right? That's yeah, Scream Factory, yep. I believe so. Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right, then. Well, thank you all again for writing in. Uh, thank you. you. Freak you. Show family, we love you. That's Thanks. Right. You, you make what we do here worthwhile. So now we're going to go around the room and tell you what we Holly! thought of. <laughs> I'm not wasting any fucking time. Holly, what did you think about this movie? Fire in the sky. Fire in the sky. Um, I really liked this movie. I really did. I, I wasn't sure. I didn't know anything about it going into it. I just knew that it was like based on a guy's testimony, loosely based on a true story. Um, and it was an alien abduction movie. But that's kind of where it ended for me. I didn't know anything else. And like I said earlier, halfway through this, I was like, why is this a freak show movie? Because this is actually like a legitimate movie. Like, what are we watching here? And then we got to the alien abduction. I was like, oh, holy shit. This is terrifying, horrifying, awful. Like, what are we watching? This is insane. And I get why we're reviewing this. Um, but yeah, I really liked it. I thought it was uh, a competent movie. It's a well it's a well thought out movie. Um, as far as like the storytelling aspect, we get the, we get the alien abduction, but it gives it to us in a very visceral way. It gives it to us in a very like good storytelling way. Um, so yeah, I really liked it. I, I, I was genuinely horrified by the alien abduction scenes. It was, yeah, I, I, just from that alone, I would consider this a horror movie because that was legitimately horrifying to me. Um, so I get why we watched it. I get why people remember this. Um, everything before that scene, again, it's a good movie. It's it's dramatic. It's a mystery. It's it's good storytelling. But then when you get to the actual alien scenes, it is memorable. It, it's it. I that will stick with me. That was genuinely horrifying. Um, I know that since I'm a little drunk, I could go on forever and ever. So I'm not going to. I would say I recommend it. It was a good time. I liked it. Um, Sean, what do you think? Uh, fire in the sky. I mean, it's no the arrival, but what is? Um, <clears throat> it's yeah. There's a lot less racist aliens in this one. <laughs> and a lot less racist aliens. A lot uh, less scorpions. Um, uh, I give this movie a demerit just for the fact that it didn't put together like uh, a soundtrack that had Deep Purple on it, which it should have. There you go. That's a good point. Come on. It had the Allman Brothers. It didn't have smoke did. on the water, okay. Colin. 
I did. It didn't go that. for the right on the nose type thing. It I was singing along, just saying. <laughs> um, it was. I was surprised at this movie. Again, I didn't know anything about it. I knew we were getting an alien abduction movie because I think me and Michaela, Colin, had recommended this to us before. Um, yeah. To watch. Um, so I knew it was aliens. I didn't know in what aspect. Um, and we don't really get it till the end of the movie. But in the meantime, we're getting a pretty good like a little character drama in here. Um, and I thought it was very good. I think everybody's doing very good. Henry Thomas is, he's got a smaller role in this, but he's doing really good. Everyone's doing really good in this. Um, I mean, I like James Garner. Um, uh, everyone's pretty much killing it. So you get a nice little drama leading up to, you know, naked alien abductions. And then the, you know, the actual alien scene, it, it fits right in there with those early, uh, unsolved mysteries, like, those weird alien abduction stories that you always used to get. And they're just always freaky. Um, this one's a little more uh, extensive than those ever were. But again, you know, you got the budget and all that shit to back it up. Um, pretty good. Pretty intense. Um, I think it's a little, might be a little long. It's an hour and 49 minutes and it's just, it drags a little bit. I don't think he needed to, I don't think he needed to float through the air for like 10 minutes. Like we could have sped a few parts of this up just a little bit, you know, That's fair. kind of get to it. I think you should leave that stuff and cut some of the other drama stuff down a little bit. I think there's stuff to cut everywhere in this movie. I see this could be an hour and a half and we could be like in and out. And I think still be, still be pretty darn good, but mm-hmm. um, I, I think it's a good movie um, and I'm going to recommend it. Fire in the sky. I like a good alien movie. Yeah. And we got sure. there. And we got there. So I recommend it. What do we got left? Colin, what did you think? <laughs> uh, well, I haven't seen this in a very long time and I thought very highly of it, you know, over the years. And so watching it again, I'm like, I think I love this movie, like unabashedly love this movie. I think, you know, just sitting there watching, it's like, this is a movie done by pros. It just feels like, you know, the kind of movie that they don't make anymore. Usually on, on a budget, budget level, you're looking at, you know, up and coming actors, uh, you know, and unproven uh, directors and everybody's putting it together and that's cool. But this is like the, the pros are doing it and it's nice and comfortable to actually see like, you know, that kind of a, uh, movie. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really well-made movie. It's a well-directed movie, a well-written movie, well-performed movie. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, uh, I think this is my go-to, like, you know, I was talking about earlier that, you know, you're always kind of, uh, there's always there's a movie that kind of lays out like if that if that happened it probably would happen like this this is my alien abduction movie you know it's like that ending is so powerful that it's like that's what it's like to be abducted by aliens you know <laughs> uh right there it's horrifying that's the that's the uh the whole thing um i mean i get it the 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 um the fear of the alien abduction is uh, you know it's it, there's if it you know it's a it's an event that you have absolutely no control over and there's no repercussions and no one's ever held accountable because the aliens always just go to space and so you're left to deal with the uh fallout of that you know on earth with people who don't believe you i mean it's uh you know an anxiety uh it's just ripe for you know uh um cinematic exploration i didn't like dark skies though that was the blumhouse alien uh alien Mm. visitation movie um you know, I suppose poltergeist and so, you know, you get ghosts. If a ghost is fucking with you, you can't do anything about that either. They get to do whatever they want, you know, see the entity for a, a similar anxiety in, in, in creating experience. There's, there's different lore with ghosts, like exercising and like asking them to leave. Like there's different lore, but with aliens, it's really like if they're there, they're there. Right. Yeah. But the entity, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, um, but, um, yeah, I, I think uh, you you have to see this movie. I think this is uh, one of the best, if not the best, uh, alien abduction story. I think you know that I've seen. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go with uh, and you know again it could be because also I'm a horror guy and the end of it <laughs> plays into that. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna uh, absolutely recommend Fire in the Sky. Michaela, what'd you think? Yeah, so a few months back, I heard this movie mentioned on a podcast, and the way they were talking about it, I was like, why have I never seen this, let alone, I'd never even heard of it. So I sent a message to our group chat, and I was like, has anybody seen this? Like, is it worth watching? And Colin, you, like, immediately responded, like, yes, it is absolutely worth watching. You're like, there's one scene that's super memorable, 
but the whole thing's worth watching. And ever since then, I've had it in my back pocket for the freak show because we there just really isn't enough good alien abduction movies. Agreed. And, and this one is so good. Like it's like I said, it's like a prestige version of of these movies. And you know, I listen to a lot of paranormal podcasts and like. Uh, unexplained mysteries podcast and i always approach them with like the skepticism of like well how would someone fake this and why would they fake this and with travis walton i go back and forth all the time on what i believe and i think that what i always come back to is like well what did he do for five days where the fuck was he and how did no one see him for five days was he just out in the woods for Ted five Bundy days did it yeah <laughs> I mean, but Ted Bundy also planned that shit. Like, so are we thinking that Travis Walden planned this in advance? And well, like, could have. I understand that during those five days, his coworkers have a reason to agree because they're being accused of murder, right? So they have a reason to agree to the alien story. But all these years later, if it wasn't true, why wouldn't one of them come out and be like, yeah, he's a fucking liar. Like, he's a fucking liar and I almost went to prison because of him. Like, why would they not say that? Yeah. Um, I think getting six or seven people to go along with a lie is a lot harder than most people think. Um, yeah. And that's what makes me think there is some truth to it. Um, as far as the people that claim this is like part of a get, ri- get rich quick thing, like I don't really know how much money there is in that. Like, I mean, for him, it obviously worked out pretty well. He got a book deal. He got his, a movie and all that stuff. But think of but how many people had... Yeah. Oof. Think of how many people that have have stories like this that that doesn't happen, you know? Yeah. Um, he just got, if that's the case, he got super fucking lucky, you know? Because his perfect plan to get rich quick worked out just the way he wanted it to. Um, but even still, how rich is he now? Does he work? Like, I, you know, these are all questions I have when I think about this. <laughs> but yeah. anyways, this movie, it's awesome. Um, it is, yeah, it is definitely like a tense thriller kind of drama for a while there. But then once it hits the alien stuff, it is so gross and so tense. And like, it's stuff I haven't really seen before in like an alien movie. And it's just, I, it's really interesting. I do agree, Sean, you could cut some stuff from this movie and it is a little longer than it needs to be. I think th- though that they think they're building more tension by doing that, but it hits a point where it just starts dragging and you could definitely cut something out, but it's still worth a watch. It's a great movie. I, I It's kind of weird how forgotten this movie seems to be like, we have very little mail on it. A lot of people seems like they haven't even heard of it. So definitely give it a watch and tell your friends about it. Mm-hmm, for sure. I will say like, just, I mean, unrelated, but kind of related. Like I, I'm someone who believes in paranormal stuff because I've had experiences. So I know what it's like, like to be in Travis's shoes. If he's actually telling the truth, like I, I relate to that. So sure, like, Holly. Sure. I understand. Like people don't <clears throat> believe me when I talk about it. But, like, I get it. I get where he's coming from. I don't know. I just thought that was an interesting, like, aspect. But this is me. Well, that Sorry. means that the movie is Saturday Night Freak Show approved, right? That was all four of us, I believe, signed off on Fire in the Sky. So now it's a must watch. You have to find it. And right now, currently today, as we record this, it is streaming on Amazon Prime, but you can rent it. May change tomorrow. Who knows? You can rent it wherever. <laughs> um, okay, so next week we're going to watch a movie that's chosen by... You, Colin. Colin, what are we going to watch next week? Uh, well, we're going to go back. This is your quote-unquote Christmas pick. Oh, well, you yeah. Don't have, not, but, not doing but, the holiday no, thing, then, I guess. Right, we don't have to do holiday <laughs> shit. I'm celebrating a Blu-ray release. This, And we're going back to one of my favorite things. We're going to see the very first Hammer Horror film. Well, that's not true either. But the one that no, like put them on the map, and that's uh, The Curse of Frankenstein with uh, Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee. So, um, and yes. you folks out there have time to get the Warner Archive special two disc edition. We're not being paid for this. Uh, we should be, <laughs> but we should be. All right. So, until next time, uh, ladies and germs, the basement is going dark.